As Americans, we are taught from an early age to value the study of history as a vital part of our education and our identity as a nation. Study of the American West has been extensive. The number of books published is second only to those written about the Civil War. But within all those volumes, references to African Americans are extremely rare. Today, historians are rediscovering the contributions of African Americans, recognizing their impact as a people, and exploring race relations as they played out in the Wild West. In this five-part series, Professor Quintard Taylor focuses on African American history in terms of forming communities, combating racism, and changing social and political patterns in the development of the American West. The African American West is presented by the University of Washington's College of Arts and Sciences and the UW Alumni Association. Major funding for this program was provided by Macy's, continuing its long-term commitment to promoting black history by making this video series available to secondary schools throughout Washington State. Additional funding was provided by the University Bookstore and UW Medicine. The Civil War freed the slaves. It also opened vast tracts of land to settlement through the Homestead Act. In this talk, Professor Taylor looks at homesteaders, cowboys, and buffalo soldiers and their journey to the West prior to 1900. Good evening and welcome to the second lecture in the series, The African American West, 1528 to 2000. I am Emil Petrie, Associate Vice President for the Office of Minority Affairs at the University of Washington. Tonight's lecture is entitled, To the Frontier, Homesteaders, Cowboys, and Buffalo Soldiers Search for Freedom in the West. Our concept of the frontier would be challenged by the information you hear tonight. The word frontier has several definitions. One is a region that forms the margin of settled and developed territory. Another is a line of division between different or opposed things. Tonight's lecture will include both of these meanings as Dr. Taylor shares information about frontiers that we have not heard before. This summer, Dr. Taylor traveled to a different frontier at the request of the U.S. State Department. In a distant city called Ekaterinburg, which is the home of Boris Yeltsin and the location where the Tsar was killed during the Russian Revolution, a U.S. consulate saw Dr. Taylor's website and found valuable and relevant information on that region. After perusing the vignettes of famous and not so famous African Americans, he asked Quintard to share his research with people of various cultures who reside east of the Euro mountain range. The region is multiracial area, blending ethnicities of European and Asian culture. During his visit, Dr. Taylor gave 14 presentations at 10 universities within 10 days. <laughs> this presentation must feel easy compared to that undertaking. <laughs> he spoke to many different people, mostly through translators, on the same subject he is exploring with you in this series. You know, it is wonderful to know that the University of Washington is being represented by Dr. Taylor in assisting the blending of cultures in Siberia and other parts of the world. Now let me welcome our speaker. Please help me welcome Professor Quintard Taylor.
Thank you, Emil, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and, and Emil made reference to the website, and I have to uh, apologize for a faux pas from last week. I was supposed to share with you uh, this website. I was supposed to uh, show you what, what we were attempting to do in terms of providing background information, and so I'm going to do that presently. Here we go. Okay. Uh, and you click on here, African American History in the West. Uh, go down to vignettes of significant people and places in the West. I'm very proud of all of these. These are essentially short descriptions, and I'll, I'll pull up one. Short descriptions of African Americans in the American West, and they have been provided, if I can get this over, they have been provided by various historians across the, uh, across the nation. Let's see what comes up here. This is Barbara Behan. Barbara is at the University of Montana. She's an independent scholar working in Missoula. We have asked, and, and people have agreed to do this, we've asked over 100 historians, and these are the people, and you can see some familiar faces, these are the people who already agreed to contribute vignettes and have vignettes up on the site, and they represent a cross-section of historians. Historians from major universities, graduate students, uh, independent historians, people from uh, historical societies, and on and on and on. All of, the, all of them share in common a love of African American history, particularly in the West, and they've written vignettes to, to reflect on that love. And so I'm, I'm really moved by the fact that these folks have all volunteered to help. Uh, one other thing, let's, uh, this is a bibliography on the African American West. You have a shortened version of the bibliography, but this is a longer one for those who, who are interested. And primary documents. These are primary documents that are available. They are available to you. They're available to literally anybody in the world. These are the documents that attracted the people in Russia, uh, along with the vignettes, and prompted them to say, uh, Quintara Taylor ought to come to Siberia. So I urge you, I, I urge you, well, maybe that's not a recommendation here, but, but, but I urge you to take a look at these and, uh, you know, when you, when you get home, I'm very proud of this website, and I'm, I'm most proud of the fact that most of this was done, not by, not by me, but by volunteers. Okay, let's, let's uh, begin the presentation for the night, because we've actually got a lot to cover. Um, we talked last time about the paradox of slavery and freedom in the West. We talked about the fact that African Americans... Uh, literally had their freedom challenged even in places like California and certainly in places like Texas. The Civil War comes in 1861 and by 1865 the shackles of slavery are finally broken. By 1865 all black folks are th theoretically, theoretically free. Except that there, there is still a question as to what freedom means for all of these African Americans uh, who've been enslaved. 90%, let's put it in context, 90% of the black population was enslaved until 1865. Now that 90% could not travel to the West on their own uh, before 1865. In 1865 though, theoretically, theoretically, they have the ability to move anywhere in the country, including the American West. And yet, they don't come immediately and the reason they don't come immediately is because one important question still needs to be resolved in this region. And that question is whether or not there will be full and extensive political rights, civil rights, extended to these people in this area of, of the country. Black Westerners knew that there was a reconstruction process going on in the South. And of course, we're all very much familiar with reconstruction in the South. But they also understood that they had uh, disabilities of their own. I, I show this first image. This, these are black San Franciscans proudly participating in the city's 4th uh, of July celebration. Uh, this is the first time they've done so. Uh, they, they see this as an acknowledgement of the fact that they are becoming part of the body politic. Uh, but yet there are problems. Yet there are disabilities, and I want to talk about those disabilities. Uh, black Westerners, black Westerners, in the period between 1865 and 1870 uh, were denied a whole host of basic rights. They were denied the right to vote. They were denied the right to serve in the state militias. They were excluded from public schools in virtually every area of the West, whether that area had been slave or free before. They were excluded from the jury box. 
They were excluded from public transportation and, and accommodations. In other words, Western blacks face many of the same, no, let me strike that, most of the same disabilities as blacks in the South. We might think of the West as a place that's different, a place where there's greater opportunity, but that opportunity wasn't present at least in 1865. There was a, there was a question of whether or not rights would be extended to, uh, to African Americans, even in this region. As San Francisco newspaper editor Philip A. Bell declared in July of 1865, we have removed slavery, which gave out evidence of our woe. America, of course, has no slave within her domain. And then he warned, she must have no disenfranchised citizen beneath the shadow of her flag. What he didn't realize when he said that in 1865 was that there would be a tremendous struggle that would be waged in California for the next five years to eventually get blacks the right to vote. Notice I said in California. This is not the Deep South. We all know about the struggles that were going to be waged in, in the Reconstruction South. But in California, in Oregon, in other states and territories in the West, there would be a challenge to the idea of full black citizenship rights, uh, full black participation in the body politic. Now, in an area as diverse as the West, as, as we've said before, there are going to be a variety of responses to African Americans. To some extent, those responses are predicated on the level of population, but not necessarily. There are some places that are going to clearly be more advanced or more sympathetic, let's put it like this, more sympathetic to the extension of black rights than others. For example, Nevada becomes the first state in the nation to ratify the 15th Amendment which gave black men the right to vote. And the Nevadans are still very, very proud of that. Example number two, and, and this is an example of the beginning of a political struggle that will last, in some ways, well into the 20th century. In Texas, 20 white men, mostly former plantation owners, and 150 black men, mostly ex-slaves, gathered together in Houston on July 4th, 1867. And at that August meeting, at that very important meeting, they created the Texas Republican Party. Folks, that's the party of George W. Bush. <laughs> that's the party of, of K. Bailey Richardson. That's the party of a whole host of Tom DeLay, my God. Uh, you know, I've always wondered, let, let me make an aside here, I've always wondered uh, when these people meet and have their, when the Republicans, the Texas Republicans meet and have their annual conventions, do they have the, the pictures of these men who founded the party? I, I suspect not. I suspect that even they don't realize the very interesting uh, and ironic history of their own party. But let me, let me bring us back to the local area. There were at least some in Washington Territory who supported the idea of full suffrage. This is the Olympia Commercial Age, a, a newspaper, a white newspaper in Olympia, uh, and this is what they wrote in the 1870. Uh, I won't read all of it to you, but essentially they, they say, and I, I'll read the last paragraph, it will be a happy day for the country when the people shall no more care to inquire whether a voter or a candidate for office is white or black than whether he is tall or short. In other words, those were important words to live by in 1870, and we haven't quite, we haven't quite gotten to that point even to this day. Of course, one of the reasons we haven't gotten to that point is because there was significant opposition to black voting. Let me show you these, these two uh, quotes, and these are from papers in the West. Again, this is, this is not the South responding to black voting. These, this is the Oregonian in Portland, and this is the Sacramento uh, Bee. And they are clearly showing their opposition to African-American voting in the West and indeed anywhere in the country. Nonetheless, nonetheless, African-Americans are going to begin to challenge for their civil rights, regardless of what, what people say, regardless of whether people say they should have these rights. Black people are of the mind that these rights are given to them by God, not by, by the human population. And as a result, they are going to be destined to share in the political liberties of everyone else in the, in the country. Let me give you an example of this. And I will, I will suggest to you that there is a political campaign, there is a civil rights campaign that begins in the West very early on. Indeed, I argue that it begins in the 1860s, the early 1860s, when the nation itself is still involved in the Civil War. Let me give you an example. In 1862, a 19-year-old San Francisco African-American woman named Charlotte Brown became California's Rosa Parks. 
I mean that, I, what I mean by that is that she was ejected from a San Francisco streetcar because of her race. In other words, she was not allowed to ride on the streetcar because of her race. She decided to protest. She decided to challenge. She didn't organize a bus boycott, but she did do the next best thing. She filed the lawsuit. And she brought the suit against the omnibus uh, company in San Francisco. And there was a jury trial, and the jury eventually deliberated, and they gave her uh, just five cents as, a, as an award. They said that she was discriminated against, but they gave her only five cents as, as an award for, for that discrimination. Three days later, she went back out. She attempted to ride the streetcar again. Again, she was ejected, and she almost knew this was going to happen, and she brought a second lawsuit. This lawsuit uh, was going to eventually result in $3,000 in damages, which was a huge sum of money at that time. Uh, and, and essentially, she thought that she had won her case. Five weeks later, she attempts to ride the omnibus uh, streetcar again. And despite the verdict, despite the earlier verdict, uh, she is pushed off the streetcar. This time, she files suit for a third time. And only on the third time, only on the third time, is she finally allowed to ride. Only in the third time uh, is, the, is the company forced to admit that it will, it will open its doors, open, literally open its cars uh, to everyone. I use this example to suggest that, that there is a debate that's going on all over the West. Now, this is, this is actually uh, what I call an anti-desegregation cartoon. Essentially, there are a lot of, of, of whites or European Americans in San Francisco who were upset with the judge's decision when he ruled in her favor and with the jury's uh, uh, decision as well in an earlier case. And so there's, there's contestation. In other words, even in a place like San Francisco, one is not exactly sure of, of his or her rights if one is African Americans. Nonetheless, I think this example shows that black people could effectively organize the struggle for those rights. That, uh, that Charlotte Brown was not by herself, that, in, that indeed there were going to be hundreds, if not thousands of people, in black mostly, but also including uh, whites in California who would aid her in her campaign to try to break segregation uh, on the streetcars. Black Californians would soon be joined in that struggle by African Americans who were re residing about 2,000 miles away in Kansas. In 1866, this is just after the Civil War, this is just after slavery had officially ended, black Kansans organized themselves to, to, to demand their civil rights, to demand full civil rights for themselves uh, in, in their new state. They meet in, 18, in 1866 in Lawrence, Kansas, and there they challenged the widely held notion that black voting was a privilege which the white male electorate could confer or deny at its pleasure. Their argument was simple. These are natural rights, quote unquote. This is some of the language of the 19th century. And therefore, no one, no electorate can determine who will, be, who will have the right to vote. And then they add something else. And I'm, I'm not going to read, well, I'll read part of it to you. They add this very, very powerful statement, as you can see above. They, they say, we must be a constant trouble in this state until it extends to us equal and exact justice. Folks, these were very, very powerful words. I thought I was reading the words of Malcolm X when I first saw this. Uh, we must be a constant trouble in this state until it extends to us equal and exact justice. These were words that were written by African Americans who were determined to, to gain their freedom, their total freedom, in 1866 in Kansas. Black Westerners' campaign for suffrage uh, would have national implications in the neighboring territory of Colorado. Let me try to explain the backdrop here, and, I, and I'll get to this man in a minute. In 1860, when Colorado Territory was organized, African American men actually had the right to vote. In 1864, the vote was taken from them, for reasons we won't get into now, but in 1864, the vote was denied them. In 1865, African Americans, and they only numbered about 150 people in the entire territory of Colorado, and Colorado only had about 20,000 people. Uh, th those 150 African Americans, mostly male, there were only about 20% of the population that was female, those, those uh, African Americans decided to mount a campaign, wage a campaign, to regain, notice I didn't say gain, to regain the suffrage rights that had, that had been taken away or that had been denied them. The leader of this campaign was William Jefferson Hardin. Hardin was a barber by trade, 
but he was also a, a politician. And fortunately for the, for the people in Colorado, he was a person who had, had gotten to know Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner. And I've always said that if you're a black person in America, it's always good to know a Massachusetts senator. <laughs> and and, and uh, William Harden was able to use, or if you will, exploit that connection uh, to get in. He would become the leader of the campaign to, to regain suffrage for African Americans in, in Colorado. And he would, in 1866, send a letter to Senator Charles Sumner, a letter and a telegram to Senator Charles Sumner uh, at, in Washington, D.C., to his congressional office, describing what was going on in Colorado and asking the senator from Massachusetts to oppose, to oppose statehood for Colorado until it restores voting rights for African American men. In other words, he was literally going to hold statehood hostage. He and these other blacks were gonna hold statehood hostage until black rights were going to be, uh, well, until black rights were going to be restored. And of course, you can see here the uh, part of the statement that, uh, that he makes in that famous telegram. Slavery went down in a great deluge of blood, and I greatly fear that unless the American people learn from the past to do justice now and in the future, that their cruel prejudices will go down in the same blood. This was made, this statement was made less than two years after the Civil War had ended. Two years after there had been the bloodiest conflict in the history of the country, and yet these issues were unresolved. At least as far as Hardin was concerned, these issues were unre unresolved, and they had to be resolved before there would be full peace. Senator Sumner agreed. He read the telegram from uh, the black barber from, from Denver, Colorado, uh, before the U.S. Senate, the entire U.S. Senate, and then he publicly declared his opposition to Colorado statehood. And because of his stance, eventually there were enough Republicans, enough uh, people in, in the Senate who refused to allow Colorado to come into, uh, come into the Union at that point. But this is not the end of the story. There were Republicans uh, at the national level who were so upset at what was going on in Colorado, at the denial of voting rights, that in 1867, in January 1867, Congress passed the Territorial Suffrage Act. The Territorial Suffrage Act would extend voting rights to black males in all of the territories of the United States, including Colorado Territory. And to show you the significance of this, the importance of this, I want you to, to understand the order in which voting rights are going to be extended. Voting rights come first to blacks in Washington, D.C. in 1866. They come secondly to the blacks in the territories, partly because of, of Hardin's efforts uh, in 1866 and 1867. Thirdly, they will come to blacks in the South as a consequence of Reconstruction. And then finally, with the 15th Amendment, with the 15th Amendment, they will be extended to African American males, at least, throughout the country. So indeed, African Americans in, in Colorado, African Americans in the West, were not sort of coming up behind or bringing up the rear in terms of the struggle. They were very much in the forefront in terms of, of what would become, or what was already, a national struggle to bring about, uh, to bring about civil rights uh, and voting rights for African American males. With the question of voting rights settled in all of the West, with the exception of Texas, and Texas is always the grand exception, you're gonna see me coming back to this over and over again. With the exception of Texas, voting rights, the voting rights question is settled. Uh, and as a result, African Americans theoretically have the ability to come to the West. Theoretically, they can come to the West and try to achieve freedom. These are black citizens of Helena, Montana. Yeah, I know, a lot of people don't even realize there were black citizens in Helena, Montana, but th these are black citizens in Helena, Montana, celebrating the ratification of the 15th Amendment in April of 1870, even though the black citizens of Helena, Montana and other areas of Montana, because Montana is a territory, have been voting since 1867. But once the, once the amendment is passed, once the 15th Amendment is, is ratified, then they understand that voting rights for all black people across the country are guaranteed. But as, as I said before, there's, there's still a question. There's still a large question looming. What is going to be the reaction to those blacks who come to the West? What is going to be the reaction? Will those blacks be extended freedom in this area of the country? These are blacks making their way to the West. And let me show you two responses. The first one is the Topeka colored citizen. Obviously, they have a, they have a, a self-interest in mind. They, they certainly want African Americans to come to the West. And notice what they say here. 
uh, come to the West, come to Kansas, and Kansas looms very large, as you're going to find out in a minute, in order that you may be free from the persecution of the rebels. If blacks come here and starve, all well, it is better to starve to death in Kansas than to be shot and killed in the South, than to be shot and killed in the South. This was a powerful sentiment on the part of African Americans. But on the other hand, look at the forerunner of the Seattle PI. And they argue that there shouldn't be very many African Americans uh, in the West, and certainly very, very few in the Pacific Northwest. And notice the reference to the Chinese. In other words, the West already has a, quote, racial problem in the minds of a lot of these people, and it would only be compounded by adding African Americans. Nonetheless, despite what the PI says, or the Seattle and Daily Intelligentsia says, black people will come. Black people will come. On a thousand mile frontier stretching from Dakota to Oklahoma, they sought out the region that they hoped would provide both freedom and opportunity. And notice I juxtaposed those two terms last time and I will continue to do so. Black people who come west are looking for economic opportunity, they're looking to try to prosper, but they're also looking for a kind of political freedom that seemingly does not exist in the south or in other areas of the country. And they particularly turn to Kansas in the 1860s and increasingly in the 1870s. And they turned to Kansas for a couple of reasons. Uh, I wanna leave this map up for a while. They turned to Kansas for a couple of reasons, uh, reasons that are both political and uh, psychological. Let me give you the, the, the reasons. First, Kansas offers potential homesteaders, regardless of race, access to vast tracts of yet to be developed farmland. Folks, in 19th century America, the greatest way to wealth, or at least what was perceived as the greatest way to wealth, was land ownership. And people all over the country wanted to access the land. And what better way than the homestead land in the West? The 1862 homestead law, which applied to Kansas and other Western states and territories, was uncomplicated and unambiguous. The federal government, according to this law, would provide 160 acres of land to any settler who paid a $12 filing fee and resided on and improved the land over five years. However, after six months, the settler could purchase the land outright for $1.25 per acre. Where can you get land in America for $1.25 an acre a day? I mean, this was a huge giveaway. This was, yeah, I, want to, I don't want to get into this in any detail, but this was a huge advantage for those who were going to be able to homestead. Now that's not to say that everybody had good land. Everybody would receive great land in, in the West. There were bad lands that were homesteaded as well, and there were a lot of people who failed uh, to, to make the land work or make the land productive. And, and of course, that's something that has to be taken into consideration. But there were tens of thousands, no, maybe even millions of people who were going to gain homesteads. And from those homesteads, uh, they would derive a basis for wealth. Uh, secondly, Kansas was completely dominated at that moment, and probably still is, by the Republican Party. The Republican Party was extremely important in the minds of African Americans at that point because the political roles of the parties were completely reversed from today, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with. Uh, the Republican Party, as Frederick Douglass said, was the ship and all else was the sea. And what he meant by that was that the Republican Party was the only major political party, only one of the major political parties that was dedicated to African American rights and African American advancement. The Democrats were just the opposite. And indeed, in some ways, the, those positions have been reversed today. Uh, but I will tell you that the, that the Democrats, particularly the Democrats in the South, were much worse than anything that we, we see taking place today. As a matter of fact, you don't have to be reminded, I hope you don't have to be reminded of the political situation in the South in the 1870s. There was Reconstruction, you all remember that from your general US history courses. You all know that Reconstruction ended formally in 1877. And it was assumed that since blacks were no longer a political factor, that would be the end of the violence directed against them. There had been tremendous violence against blacks during Reconstruction. That violence didn't stop. That violence continued after 1877, and eventually it would prompt a lot of black folks uh, to leave uh, various areas of the, uh, of the South. Um, indeed, that violence doesn't stop until well into the 20th century. And I would argue that even as I talk about the lure of the West, we always have to keep in mind, we always have to remember the fact that blacks are being propelled out of the South by the racial violence uh, that's taking place. Kansas, Kansas, 
looked like the place where they wouldn't have to worry about that racial violence because there were people in charge of, in Kansas who seemingly were politically favorable, uh, favorably disposed to them. When a St. Louis Globe reporter asked the woman, these are, these are people who are headed to Kansas. These are, if you will, I, refugees. These aren't, aren't just people who are, who are trying to settle new lands, although that's certainly part of it, but they are also people who are fleeing oppression in the South. And I'll give you one example of this in a minute. When a St. Louis Globe reporter asked a woman would a, would a child at her breast in 1879 if she would return to the South or go on to Kansas, and she had, she had a very quick response. What? Go back to the South, I'd sooner starve. Go back to the South, I'd sooner starve. Let me give you another example of this. I don't have a slide that really reflects it, but John Solomon Lewis. John Solomon Lewis was a typical, if, if we can use that word, a typical sharecropper in northeastern Louisiana. He uh, brought in crops every year. He got further and further in debt. And eventually, by 1879, uh, he decided, I've had enough of this. I'm taking my family and we're leaving. And in order to leave, he had to secret himself and his family into the swamp and wait for weeks until a riverboat came, came along to pick him up. And once that riverboat did show up and, and he, he boarded the boat uh, and the captain said, where do you want to go? Where, where's, what's your destination? He uttered one word, Kansas, Kansas. And what he meant by that was that Kansas was this place that represented uh, freedom for him and, and, and his family. And that brings me to the third point as to why Kansas was significant, was indeed almost unique in the minds of, of African Americans at that particular moment. Kansas was the state where the abolitionist tradition seemed to loom large. It was the place where John Brown first took direct action to try to destroy the institution of slavery. And where, as we said last week, John Brown and other white men rode into Missouri and actually freed slaves, as many slaves as they could. Kansas was the first northern state to enlist African Americans as soldiers uh, in the Army of the United States. Kansas supported the Emancipation Proclamation. It was one of the first states uh, to publicly uh, uh, say that they supported Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. And it was the, one of the first states, I think it was the third state, in fact, to ratify the 13th Amendment, which destroyed the institution of slavery. Kansas, however, by the 1870s would become a place of refuge, not just for black folks, not just in the minds of black folks. There would be Europeans who would come, people who would come from Germany and Poland and Russia, and who would make their way to the Kansas Plains because they saw Kansas as a place of refuge and opportunity. So when blacks said, said we want to come to Kansas and we want to, to settle on the Kansas frontier, in effect, they were doing much uh, what everyone else or much what millions of other pe people were doing when they looked to Kansas and looked to the American West. As a matter of fact, there's, there's uh, one person who said when uh, he was challenged by someone as to why he and other blacks would go to the frontier, He's, and, and they said, why would you do so? And he said, that's what white men go to new countries for, isn't it? You don't tell them to stay behind because they are poor. The Homestead Act was made for poor people. Uh, and so I want you to see, I want you to see the faces of some of these people who were making their way west. And many of them, or, or I shouldn't say many of them, but a subset of them would go to the place that would become famous even in the 1870s and 1880s uh, as a place of refuge and settlement for African Americans. And that place was Nicodemus, Kansas. They would, they would follow the, uh, their brother into Kansas and they would end up in Nicodemus. I won't give you all of the background on Nicodemus except to say that it was actually founded by W.R. Hill, who was a white uh, land speculator but he decided that he wanted to create uh, an area of refuge for African Americans and make a little bit of money at the same time. And as a result, he contacted six African Americans, all from, interestingly, all from Lexington, Kentucky, or all had a background, who had a background in Lexington, Kentucky. And they, in turn, began to contact others uh, as they set up or they established the Nicodemus Town Company. The Nicodemus Town Company was established in 1877. And at that time, it was on the frontier. At that time, it was about as far west, no, maybe even farther west than most of the settlement in Kansas at that time. They named their community Nicodemus after a legendary African slave prince who had managed to buy his freedom. They chose to locate their colony on the Solomon River. 
In other words, they, they felt that they almost had a biblical imprenditor as, as, as they moved to the West. These, these first settlers had to bring others, had to encourage others to come as well, had to encourage others to follow. And so they wrote back home, they wrote to Lexington, Kentucky, and in July of 1877, the first group of settlers arrived in Nicodemus and they were followed in, in March of 1878 by more settlers. These people from Kentucky mostly, but eventually they would come from Tennessee and, and, and other areas. These people from Kentucky had no idea of what they would find. Indeed, Graham County and more specifically Nicodemus, uh, the area around Nicodemus at that time, was flat, barren, windswept. It was considered the worst of the worst land in Kansas. And most people didn't think that anybody would be able to grow, uh, grow wheat in this very stubborn land. African Americans, of course, uh, rose to the occasion, they rose to the challenge and attempted to try to create a new life for themselves. Uh, let me give you an example of some of the first of the settlers who come. This is Willianna Hickman. We, on, we know about her only because, only because she uh, wrote down her experiences a little bit later on. She had a very difficult time in Nicodemus. Notice what she said uh, when, uh, when she got to the horizon and her husband said, there's Nicodemus. She said, I looked with all the eyes I had. Where's Nicodemus? Where's Nicodemus? I don't see it. And I will say, as a footnote to all of this, that Willianna Hickman eventually got over her initial shock. She became one of the people who stayed, and, and she became part of a prominent family that lives in Nicodemus to this day. But the initial reaction, the initial reaction was certainly, I think, one, one that, was, that was frightening for her uh, as she reached the West Kansas uh, Plains. Nicodemus became the first predominantly black town to receive national attention. And by that, I mean the New York Times reporter, uh, a reporter came out and covered the story. And once you make the New York Times, then you do get national coverage. And, and essentially, uh, there was a lot of attention that was going to be focused on Nicodemus. But there would be, and I, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but there would be other towns that would be created in Kansas and far more of these towns that would be established in Oklahoma and the Indian Territory. And even, a little bit later on, even some in California and Arizona and Nevada. In other words, throughout the West, there would be African Americans who would try to establish towns or agricultural colonies where they could both prosper economically, but as importantly, where they could be free, where they could sense that they could have uh, political rights as well. Um, the best way to describe Oklahoma is the, the talk about the fact that this was at one time all Indian country. All of this area that we see on the map here as Oklahoma it belonged to the five nations. Uh, the Civil War unfortunately prompts the federal government to take away more than half of that land. Uh, and for a while, that land, the western part of the area, which will become the Oklahoma Territory proper, the western part of that area is given over to other Native American groups. But there is increasing pressure from settlers in Kansas, settlers in Texas, settlers in Arkansas to open up this land, to open, since the Indians, uh, since there are relatively few Indians on the land. And eventually Congress succumbs to that pressure. And in 1889, in 1889, the first of a series of runs will be made on Oklahoma. In other words, Oklahoma will be opened up to, uh, to settlement by non-Indians. For African Americans, Oklahoma wasn't simply uh, a, a, an opportunity for settlement. It wasn't simply an opportunity to get a homestead. It was also, for one brief moment, a possibility for achieving uh, political freedom. The leader of that movement to try to achieve that political freedom was Edwin P. McCabe. Edwin McCabe was an interesting character, at least to me he was an interesting character. He was born in Troy, New York. Uh, he was one of the first blacks to work on the stock market uh, in the 1850s. By, and he, he was essentially a boy runner on the stock market. By the 1870s, he was in Kansas. By 1882, he became the auditor, the state auditor for Kansas. That is, he was the highest elected state official outside of the uh, African-American official, at least, outside of the American South. And I think at the time, he was about 30, what did I say, 32 years old. He was certainly the youngest black elected official at the state level. McCabe appeared to have a very bright future in Kansas, but he coupled that future 
with Nicodemus. That is, he lived in Nicodemus. He had gone to Nicodemus. And unfortunately, as Nicodemus declined, McCabe decided to look for other opportunities. And the closest opportunities were in neighboring Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma Territory. Now, there's, there's an argument that McCabe attempted to, to try to create Oklahoma Territory as an all-black territory or try to transform it into an all-black territory, try to get himself appointed governor and hopefully create uh, an all-black state. I think that's part of the, the, the myth of, of McCabe and, and the movement at the time. But McCabe did believe, he did sincerely believe that Oklahoma was west of the South. He did believe that Oklahoma could provide an opportunity for African Americans as both economic and political. Notice what he says here. Oklahoma is the paradise of Eden and the garden of the gods and on and on and on. I mean, there's a lot of this hyperbole. And, and let's, let's be very clear on this. McCabe is a typical booster. And by booster, I mean he's a guy who has land, he wants to bring other people out, he wants to get them to buy the land, and as they buy the land, he will get wealthy. But he's, he's also doing something else. He also is urging the blacks in the South to come west in the hope that they will find freedom. He off, also offers up Oklahoma as a place where they can get west of racism, where they can get west of discrimination, where they can go beyond uh, if you will, the, the kinds of perils that were going on. And for some blacks, for some blacks, uh, Oklahoma would become that land of potential opportunity. Now again, you have to understand this against the backdrop of things happening <laughs> elsewhere. 1892, at the time, just about the time he's promoting Oklahoma, there's a terrible race riot in, in Memphis. A number of people were killed. And Ida B. Wells, who eventually will emerge, if she's not already, as a major leader, a major spokesman for African Americans, uh, inadvertently aids McCabe when she says, black folks ought to quit Memphis, they ought to leave Memphis and go to Oklahoma. And as a result, more and more African Americans will begin to move west. They will begin to come to Oklahoma. And of course, uh, McCabe will try to promote this as much as he can because he believes that Oklahoma is going to be the place for, for the future for African Americans. He will, cr he will create Langston City in Oklahoma. Uh, Langston City will be an all-black city. He's very proud of the fact that it's an all-black city. He talks about the fact that it has black teachers, it has a black mayor and all the rest. And he says, this is an example a political power. This is an example, a manifestation of, of black political power, and most importantly, black self-determination at a time, at a time when African Americans see their rights being restricted all over the country. But he knows that creating one town is not enough, that he has to attract farmers, and to that end, he begins to turn to the, pos the next possibility of settlement, the Cherokee Strip. The Cherokee Strip is a vast area, a vast territory just to the west of Langston City. And McCabe, as early as, as 1891, and certainly by 1892, it's calling, he's calling for people to come to the west. Here's the, the quote. Everyone that can should go to the strip and get 160, meaning 160 acres. All you need is a Winchester, a frying pan, and the $15 filing fee. This is McCabe in the Langston City Herald. Now, uh, this is a drawing, this is a very famous drawing from the library, the State Library at Oklahoma. Uh, and it's a drawing depicting whites. But in point of fact, uh, McCabe was going to be successful in getting about 2,000 African Americans, men and women, to participate in the land rush uh, into the Cherokee Strip. And at the end of the day, and this, notice this is not just a metaphor. About people who came to Oklahoma and in these land rushes were able to stake claims. Usually, they, the land rush started at 12 noon. By 6 p.m., they were able to stake their claim. Uh, at the end of that day, that is at 6 p.m., 1,000 African-American farmers had established their claims to land in Oklahoma, or at least in that part of Oklahoma. Now, many of you may detect a certain irony here Black folks and white folks are taking lands that have been owned by Indians before, lands that have been promised to, to the Indians forever. But nonetheless, that was part of the process that was going on in Oklahoma uh, at, that, at that time. As one African American said, um, and he summarized the opening in 18, 1892 this way, the whole of Indian territory has been swallowed up by the white man, but many black men help with the swallowing. Many black men help with the swallowing. And indeed, uh, Langston, the, the area of Langston City and uh, central Oklahoma would be considered a promised land for a long time. How many of you have heard of Langston University? 
A few people. Uh, African Americans often know about Langston University. It's the, it's the largest and oldest and most prestigious uh, black college uh, in Oklahoma. It was founded by Edwin McCabe. And it was founded for Langston City. And it was founded as a way of trying to get African Americans to come to that area of central Oklahoma. Understand that, that, that there were African Americans by the thousands who would come to Oklahoma. And many of them would be successful. Indeed, by 1900, there would be 50,000 African American farmers in the Oklahoma Territory. 50,000 African American farmers. Most of these people were obviously homesteaders. Most of these people had participated in the various runs. Uh, they were very proud of the property that, that they had acquired. They were very proud of the communities that they established. These, these are, uh, this is the black store owner in Guthrie, Oklahoma Territory. Uh, Oklahoma didn't come anywhere near to being a black state, but it did offer for one brief moment, it did offer for one brief moment, the possibility of economic opportunity and political freedom. Unfortunately, that brief moment ended in 1907. That was the year that the twin territories of Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory combined and became the state of Oklahoma. The Democrats, not that I have anything against Democrats, okay, but the Democrats completely controlled or completely dominated the state legislature, and they did two things. Number one, uh, they passed a whole series of laws to restrict black voting in Oklahoma, and number two, they passed a whole series of laws that would discriminate against blacks in the social and economic realm. In other words, they created, if you will, uh, an Oklahoma that looked increasingly like the South, more like the South than the West of McCabe's dream. More like the South than the West of McCabe's dream. Uh, let me talk about one other area of homesteading. Uh, I know we're running behind in time, but I want to talk about one other area of homesteading because it's very close to home. The area that I want to mention is Deer Lake, Washington, 1906. How many of you are from, from Spokane or familiar with Spokane? Oh, okay, Deer, Deer Lake, as you know, is a very trendy area. The Kirkendalls know this is a very, very trendy area. In the 1890s, there was a considerable effort to try to create a black, a predominantly black agricultural colony in Deer Lake. And the driving force behind this was Reverend Peter Barrow Sr., who was a Vicksburg minister who was part of the, what I call the refugees out of the South uh, into the West. Uh, he was driven out of, out of Mississippi by the reconstruction process or the failure of reconstruction. And he, he worked his way across the West and eventually ended up in Spokane. And he created Calvary Church, Calvary Baptist Church in Spokane. And if you guys ever drive uh, the freeway, I-90, you'll go right past the church. It's still uh, right off the freeway. What you also may or may not know is that that was the church home for Ron Sims, our own Ron Sims. He grew up in, uh, in that church. But Reverend Barrow is important to us because he would try to establish uh, a colony at Deer Lake. He died uh, in 1900, and his son took over the project, and if eventually, eventually, the colony was going to be established, and it would run for a while. This is what the son wrote. Uh, Deer Lake will establish a place where a demonstration of the possibilities of the colored farmhand can be made. In this enterprise, we've decided to go back to the soil. I won't go through all of this, but then at, at the end, he talks about becoming part of the great development work that's going on. What he means by that is the great development work of Tuskegee Institute and Booker T. Washington. In other words, African-Americans, even in, in, in Spokane, African-Americans, even in Washington, the state of Washington, were part of this process of homesteading land and, and looking to the rural areas of, of the states and the territories for opportunity. And some of them, some of them did succeed. Some of them did become successful. Jonas Groves, Jonas Groves was the potato king. Remarkable story. He, he settled in Kansas. Um, what do I say? But how can I collapse this story? Junus Grove, uh, Groves arrives in Kansas from uh, Ohio with $1.25 in his pocket. This is the typical Horatio Algier story. And he essentially decides to, to turn himself to work. He works for what he calls starvation wages. Uh, and eventually he builds up his resources and he begins to buy land. As a matter of fact, I want to read his statement. By keeping my eyes open, always attending to duty and doing more rather than less than was required of me, I soon succeeded in having my wages raised to 75 cents a day. This was considered a fair price, and I was on the road to fortune. 
Well, let me explain what that fortune would be. 28 years after he made that statement, in 1907, he was reputedly, Junus Groves was reputedly, the world's largest grower of Irish potatoes. He had, uh, he had amassed holdings, land holdings, that amounted to 40 square miles in three Kansas counties. He and his wife, Matilda, and their 12 children lived, in, and you can see the house over there, lived in a 22-room brick home, complete with electric lights, two telephones, and hot and cold running water in all of the bathrooms. This was extremely unusual in, 19, in 1906, guys. This was almost unheard of. Uh, especially in a rural area. But, but Junus Groves was one of those examples of prosperity on the western frontier. The other example, and I'll do this quickly, is Robert Ball Anderson of Box Butte County, Nebraska. Uh, Robert Ball Anderson pretty well duplicates Groves' success, although he, he doesn't own as much land. Eventually, though, he will own about 3,000 acres in Nebraska, which makes him the largest African-American uh, landowner in the state. And he, he talks about his life and his success. He says in an autobiography, and I'm reading only part of this, I am old now and I can't do much work, but I have a good farm and money in the bank to tide me over in my old age. I am a rich man today, or at least rich enough for my own needs. Folks, these are examples of opportunity. These are examples of the promise of the West. Yes, that promise was compromised. There's no question that, the, uh, that there were those who were going to try to restrict black rights. There were no, there's no question that there were those who were going to try to deny opportunity. But at the same time, African Americans, as always would be the case, would make a way when there was no way. They would open up opportunities when it appeared that none existed, and they would, in the process, completely transform the various areas of the West. This is the fun part for me. Uh, and let me just make a, a small caveat. I, I started work on uh, African Americans in the West about 30 years ago. Many of you know that. And it amazed me that for the longest time, and maybe even to this day, there were those who assumed that when we met blacks in the West, we were talking about cowboys. <laughs> and I won't give you all the examples of how this has come down, but, but let me suggest to you that cowboys are part of the story, but they're only a small part of the story. Nonetheless, I want to acknowledge that the cowboys existed, the, the, that they were uh, in and of uh, the West. And the other group that I want to talk about, and I think I'll spend a little bit more time on them tonight, are the Buffalo Soldiers, because for a couple of reasons. Number one, because there were far more of them, but number two, because since they work for the federal government, we have far better records. <laughs> so, so we know a lot more about the Buffalo Soldiers than we know about the Cowboys. But, but as I suggest, the Cowboys and the Buffalo Soldiers are kind of iconic groups in, in terms of the African American West. They are, they are the groups that everybody sort of notices. Uh, and the, one of the things that I'll say about the Black Cowboys is that, unfortunately, there were relatively few of them that they were not nearly as numerous as, as the images that have been projected over the years. Indeed, when people started talking about the Black West in the 1960s and 1970s, they most, almost invariably talked about cowboys. And yet the cowboys are not, at least to my estimation, the most important uh, aspect of the Black Western experience. And you know, we've talked about some of this before, and we're gonna talk about uh, other aspects of that experience. One of the reasons for this is because the cowboys were relatively small in number. The cowboys were relatively small in number. And what I mean by this is not just African-American cowboys, but cowboys in general. Let me give you some statistics that, that indicate this. According to the US Census of 1890, there were 61,000 ranchers, herders, and drovers in the entire area of the West, the entire area that we, we've been discussing. They comprise only 2% of the 3 million workers in the Western states and territories. Now, there's a disconnect here. I mean, our image of the West, yes, our image of the West is that it's a place that's full of cowboys, and yet the statistics, if the Census Bureau is to be believed, simply doesn't bear this out. And I, I always thought about, you know, the, the problem of, of the image as opposed to the reality, and I realized as, as I was doing my own research that, for instance, Virginia City and the area around Virginia City, Nevada, has far more, had far more miners, and indeed even had far more clerks than, than it did cowboys or, or, or cattlemen. And yet, I don't know if many of you are old enough to remember uh, Bonanza, are you not? 
Okay, okay. You remember Bonanza. And I, I always imagine, what would Bonanza have been like if the story revolved around a clerk in Virginia City? <laughs> You know, it, it just doesn't work. It just really doesn't work. You have to have this image of the, of the large and powerful rancher and the cowboys and all the rest, you know, high chaparral, big valley, bonanza. They're all very, very powerful images, but do they reflect the reality? According to the census, they don't, that the vast majority of the people were not engaged in this business. Of, the, of the, those who were African American, of the 61,000 who were engaged in the range cattle industry, only 1,600 only 1,600 in 1890 were black. Compare this to the fact that there were 900,000 farmers, 900,000 farmers in the West, including 75,000 African Americans. And when you, when you see these figures, then you have to put in perspective this whole idea of the cowboys. Nonetheless, the census figures do uh, reflect the fact that the cowboys existed in every state and territory in the West. Uh, including right here, right here in Washington, and certainly uh, in eastern Washington. Moreover, uh, one of the things that I, I found in my own research and others who came before me was that the image that we have of the West as a place where the cowboys were almost always white, and that was an image, of course, that was projected by Hollywood for so many years, was simply not the case, was simply not true. Indeed, the cowboys represented if you will, a very much of a multicultural workforce, far more multicultural than other aspects of, of the Western economy. And let me go to the next slide. And this is, uh, this is kind of an ironic slide. This is Theodore Roosevelt. You know, Theodore Roosevelt was a cowboy himself. He was a ranch owner in the West. And here he is talking about cowboys of color. Now, he didn't use that term, but he's, uh, but he's talking about the various people that have worked with him. And, and notice, notice what, what is going on here beside Theodore Roosevelt's obvious racism, but understand what's going on. He's talking about people of various ethnicities. In South Dakota, where Theodore Roosevelt was ranching in the 1880s, there were Chicanos, there were Indians, and there were black cowboys. And if that's the case in South Dakota, imagine what it's like on the cattle frontier in the rest of, in the, rest of the region. Indeed, one of the problems that we have in terms of discussing uh, the cowboys is that we really, well, how will I put this? Cowboys, for the most part, didn't write. And because they didn't write, and because no one wrote for them or wrote about them, we have relatively scant material in which uh, we can put together to try to find out about their lives. And as a result, we end up with snippets. As a result, we end up with bits and pieces of information from all across the board. But there are enough of those bits and pieces of information to begin to paint a picture about uh, African-American cowboys. And that's what I want to talk about uh, uh, rather briefly tonight. Those cowboys, as I said before, did exist, and some of them became noted. For example, Mississippi-born slave, he was born a slave, Bose Icard, was lifted from anonymity by the praise that was given to him by his employer, a very famous Texas cattleman named Charles Goodnight. You may know Charles Goodnight as the, the guy who founded the Goodnight Loving Trail in the West. And notice what he says about Icard. Uh, he, is, uh, he suggests that Icard is his best worker. And these kinds of tributes were not uncommon throughout the West. Yes, there were relatively few cowboys, but those cowboys who did exist tended to, to win praise of their employers more times than not. I, I should add as a caveat that, uh, that we believe that most, most people who've seen the, the film or the series, Lonesome Dove, believe that uh, Danny Glover's character was based on Bowles Icard, a real, a real black cowboy. Let me talk about another African-American cowboy who actually actually challenges the, the myth or the stereotype in a variety of ways. His name is D.W. or Daniel Webster, 80 John Wallace, and he's a cowboy who becomes a rancher. Most cowboys would remain cowboys all their lives. They would remain poor, but some cowboys crossed the line. Some were able to accumulate uh, resources and, able, and, and buy, uh, buy land. And, and D.W. Wallace uh, was one of those. As a matter of fact, uh, there is very little in his life, his early life, that would suggest anything that would happen to him later. He was born a free man in 1860. He was not born a slave, but he was born near Inez, Texas, and he started out as a cowboy. And as a cowboy, he had the fate of many of the other cowboys. And you can see, this is one of the reasons why he's interesting, you can see he left uh, an interview uh, that talks about the situation uh, in the West. Uh, he, he described his life on the cattle frontier, but he also would, by 1900, 
began to accumulate land, and ultimately, ultimately, he would have a 10,000 acre ranch in West Texas, and he would become one of the most successful ranchers uh, in the entire state. Uh, the question that is often raised, and certainly the question that I've tried to raise, and I think I've, I've answered it, is that the cowboys, that the black cowboys face discrimination. After all, they work mostly in Texas, which was very much Southern in culture as much as it was Western. Uh, they, in many instances, have been slaves before uh, the, the Civil War. And we talked about the fact that we believe that the majority of black cowboys, or excuse me, the majority of cowboys in Texas in the 1850s were in fact uh, slaves. Uh, and yet they were, they were involved in a, in a rapidly expanding, and if I might add, a rapidly whitening range cattle industry in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. In other words, the number of black cowboys didn't go up significantly, but the number of whites involved in the range cattle industry increased dramatically, and as a result, the percentage of blacks in that, uh, in that group got smaller and smaller. But one of the things that I've noted here is that it seems, it seems there was very little racial discrimination directed against black cowboys. First of all, they got equal pay for equal work which was extremely unusual. Very seldom did blacks have equal pay for, for the kind of work that they did alongside, alongside whites. Secondly, for, for what we can gather, most of the cowboys tended to exist under the most difficult circumstances. That is, they, they lived out in the open, uh, they slept on the ground, and black cowboys experienced the same ground as white cowboys. Uh, and, so, and so there was clearly very little discrimination there. But the real telltale example is what happens when they go to town. Because town is a settled environment. Town is the place where, where customs and mores exist that could challenge uh, notions of racial egalitarianism that are found out, out uh, on the plains. And from what we've gathered, most of the black cowboys who came to towns, like Dodge City, uh, ended up being treated fairly equally. Uh, that is, they were not discriminated. We have very few examples of their discrimination. In fact, one of the examples I'm going to give you is a kind of a negative example. That is, it's, it's an example of a situation when someone attempts to discriminate against a black cowboy. Uh, an African American, a Texas African American, comes up with, uh, on the trail uh, in 1878. He arrives in Dodge City, and of course Dodge City, as you know, is one of the most famous of the cattle towns uh, from that era. And he tries to check into the Dodge House, which is the leading hotel, the leading hotel in, in Dodge City. And the clerk says, we have no rooms. We have no rooms. And of course, black folks have heard that, that line a lot of times. The cowboy, according to the clerk, and this is the clerk telling the story, okay, but telling it years later. According to the clerk, the cowboy pulls out, and I want to quote here, the longest barrel six shooter that I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> and he waved it in my face and said, you're a liar. And the clerk at that time found a room for this black cowboy. <laughs> now, I, I, don't, you know, I don't suggest that this is the way to deal with discrimination all the time, certainly not to, by the day's standards. But, but the very fact that the clerk can recall this and the very fact that this is the way in which uh, a potential example of discrimination was dismissed suggests that the cowboys indeed uh, uh, were treated with a kind of a rough equality. And indeed, one of the things that I found, and I want to go to the next slide, one of the things that I found was that where, whereas for us in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, there was this grand discovery of black cowboys as if you know, we had never known they existed before. And of course, a lot of us didn't because we grew up with the Hollywood images of cowboys. In point of fact, Westerners, regardless of their racial background in the 1880s and 1890s, assumed that there would be black cowboys. And they assumed that that would be part of the natural order of things that indeed it wasn't unusual for there to be black cowboys or Latino cowboys or, you'll love this, Indian cowboys. Indian cowboys, yes. There were, there were Indians who worked throughout the range cattle industry as well. Uh, the quote that you see up on the wall is about, uh, up on the screen, is about Lawson Fleetwell, and I won't read to you all of it, but notice the second paragraph. Very interesting because, because here, there's sort of a disparaging account of the cowboys, but not black cowboys, but the cowboys, uh, the cowboys in general. By the way, the two images, uh, the image at the top is of a black and, and a Latino cowboy working in Texas along the Rio Grande. The image at the bottom, to show you that cowboys existed everywhere, is a black uh, cook uh, on, a, on a trail drive in Montana. 
In other words, the blacks were all over the West engaged in this kind of activity. Let me leave you with one, one example of an outgrowth of the range cattle industry, and that was the rodeo. Uh, and, and of course, we all know about the rodeos that evolved in this area of the country, the most famous being the Pendleton Roundup. I know you're all familiar with the Pendleton Roundup. What you're probably not familiar with is the fact that two of the six cowboys who established the Pendleton Roundup in 1906 were African American. That is, they were black cowboys from, from eastern, uh, eastern Oregon. And the most famous of the, of the cowboy stars or the rodeo stars of that time period was George Fletcher. I had the distinct honor of interviewing uh, Mr. Fletcher, unfortunately, when he was in a nursing home and only uh, months before he died uh, in 1975. But he was a remarkable man. He was a legend in Pendleton. Everyone respected him because of his abilities, uh, particularly, uh, and, and I won't get into all of these stories, but particularly because uh, some people have felt that he had been cheated out of his just due in terms of uh, the accolades that had come uh, to rodeo stars. The other person I, I will mention just in passing is Tracy Thompson, who's another star from Pocatello, Idaho. I want you to make a connection, a local connection. How many of you are familiar with uh, President Les Pierce of, uh, of uh, Evergreen College? A few people. That's his grandfather. That's his grandfather. Uh, Les Pierce is, of course, very intellectual, very erudite. He's far removed from, from the image here. But Tracy, Tom Tracy Thompson was a very famous rodeo star in Idaho and much of the, the interior west. Let me change our focus. Let me shift our, our direction in the time remaining to the other group that, as I said, will become iconic in the West, and these were the Buffalo Soldiers. And we have a lot more information about them, and the, as I said, there are a lot more of them. They were, they were the approximately 25,000 men who served in four regiments, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, and the 24th and 25th Infantry between roughly 1866 and 1910. They remain steeped in history and controversy, as you're gonna see in a minute. The Buffalo Soldiers were, certainly in the 1990s, and I think still are, the subjects of novels, documentaries, television episodes. I think some of you may remember the very famous, although still controversial, Danny Glover uh, movie uh, in 1999 called Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, yet, long before the rest of the nation recognized the Buffalo Soldiers, the 19th and 20th century African Americans saw them as heroes. 19th and 20th century African Americans saw them as heroes. Indeed, those African Americans derived considerable pride from these soldiers' role as the, quote, sable arm of the government of the United States. Carter G. Woodson, who we're all going to celebrate next month as the father of, of Negro history or the father of Black History Month, described the Buffalo Soldiers as, quote, the only hero that we Negroes had when we were growing up. The only heroes that we Negroes had when we were growing up. And I would submit that some African-American soldiers e eagerly embraced their role as heroes and eagerly embraced the, the image that they were part of the making of the West. Listen to the words of 10th Cavalry Private Henry McCombs in 1900. We made the West. We defeated the hostile tribes of Indians, and we made the country safe to live in. And it sounds like something that any, any uh, federal soldier would, would write or say uh, at that particular period of time. And indeed, the first generation of historians who look at the Buffalo Soldiers tend to follow that line. They tend to talk about the fact that the Buffalo Soldiers were hero heroic, that the Buffalo Soldiers were people who would help to conquer the frontier and make the frontier or make those areas safe for ultimate white settlement. But by the 1980s, by the 1980s, there were new images that were coming forward. Certainly, there were Native American historians who were beginning to question the role of Buffalo Soldiers. Indeed, they argue that there's a moral dilemma posed by these Buffalo Soldiers because these are black men who are killing red men for white men. In other words, they, they are people who are engaged in the subjugation of another people, uh, and the reward is not even land, is not even, and certainly, as you're going to see in a minute, not, not uh, very much respect on the part of those for whom they were defending. Uh, in, in recent years, Native American people and scholars have even gone farther in terms of their critique of the Buffalo Soldiers uh, and in terms of some of the popular uh, images that are being presented by, uh, about Buffalo Soldiers. 1994, let's fast forward to 1994. 
the U.S. Post Office decides to issue a Buffalo Soldier commemorative stamp. Representatives of the Native American movement um, uh, aim, or the American Indian movement, I'm sorry, aim, are livid. They are upset because they, they argue that this is a glorification of men who killed Indians, who killed men, Indian women, Indian men, Indian children. Indeed, in 1999, when an African-American correspondent from the Baltimore Sun visited Wounded Knee, uh, he went to the cemetery uh, and he encountered a Lakota woman and he attempted the interviewer. She said to him, and I'm quoting here, Buffalo soldiers, Buffalo soldiers and the white man killed my people. My ancestors are up there and I don't appreciate you being here. Why don't you go look at Abraham Lincoln's grave? Well, I would su submit to you that, that this, is, this is, as I said, the kind of controversy that's been evolving about Buffalo soldiers. I've been involved in debates or discussions, I like to think of them as discussions more than debates, about the role and the image of, of Buffalo soldiers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Native Americans. But the relationship between Buffalo soldiers and Native Americans is extremely complex, uh, and it's a relationship that historians are only now beginning to fully understand and comprehend. If the legacy of the Buffalo Soldier is enveloped in controversy, their origin is beyond dispute. After the Civil War, the U.S. Army was quickly reduced from 1.5 million soldiers to its pre-war total of 16,000. And in the process, uh, the Army was reorganized to create new units that were going to fight mainly in the West because that's, that's where the frontier was and that's where it seems that the difficulty was. Black soldiers were going to be part of those four units that I mentioned before, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 24th and 25th Infantry. And as a result, blacks would eventually become technically 10% of the Army of the United States in the West. In many instances, because of desertions or because of low staffing in the other units, blacks would actually comprise uh, 15 to 20%. And in some areas of the West, they would be the majority of the, bu of the Buffalo soldiers. The first men who enlisted in the cavalry and the infantry units, that is the black units, were mostly 18 and 19 year olds. They were too young to have seen service in the Civil War in 1866 or 1867. They had fairly simple reasons for joining and I want to share a couple of those with you. Former slave Reuben Waller joined the 10th Cavalry in 1867 to quote, fight in the Indian Wars that were then raging in Kansas and Colorado. On the other hand, a man named Mazik Sanko, who was a Creole from New Orleans, uh, joined the uh, army because of the possibility of education. He figured that by joining the service, he would get educational opportunities that would not be available to him in the private sector. And I might say, let me add parenthetically, that I think that was one of the major if you were one of the major factors, one of the major attractions of people, African Americans, who joined the army, at least up until World War II. And of course, after the GI Bill, it would be a major attraction for all who joined the army. Because in a sense, the GI Bill was simply an extension of this area of, of excuse me, of this idea of joining the army and gaining, gaining an education or gaining knowledge. Uh, there's another example, Private Charles Creek. I got tired of looking at mules in the face from sunrise to sunset. Actually, he should have said the other part of the anatomy of the, of the mule. And he said, there must be a better way of living in the world. And of course, he eventually uh, would join the US Army. But by the 20th century, by the early 20th century, the reasons for joining the Army would become far more complex because the Buffalo Soldiers had now become an institution. And African Americans were flocking to them precisely because of their reputation. Uh, Read the quote here. This is George Schuyler, who is, uh, many, some of you may know him as a very famous columnist for the Pittsburgh Courier from the 1930s up until the 1960s. But before that, he was a Buffalo soldier at Fort Lawton and other places. And you can see, this is from the UW archives. These are Buffalo soldiers at Fort Lawton in 1900. This is just after they had returned from China. And what did they do in China? they put down, or they were part of the force that put down the Boxer Rebellion. Many of you are familiar with the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, understand what's going on here. The Buffalo Soldiers, and you're gonna see examples of this throughout the West, but eventually after 1900, they're gonna be used in the same capacity around the world, and you know, we can fast forward to Iraq right now. That Buffalo Soldiers would be, in, uh, would be the arm of the US government. They would carry out policy, uh, and regardless of how we feel about the policy, 
these Buffalo soldiers would be on the front lines, uh, you know, making sure that that policy was instituted by the government of, of, of the United States. Uh, notice Sky, uh, Schuyler's approach here. He said, I never saw any person, any colored person in any position of authority, and he goes on. And look, look at what he says. They talked to far off places. Now, Buffalo soldiers couldn't say this in 1866 or 1867, but by 1900 they could. They talked to far off places, the Philippines, Cuba, China, Mexico, and the Indian Territory. Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. I guess they were just as exotic as somebody growing up in New York. But, but, but he talked to far off places, and, and, and he says, in the Army, I could see the world that I wanted to see and have a chance to advance myself. Folks, this sounds almost like an Army recruiting poster today. <laughs> almost like what the Army says today. Let me give you an example, kind of a cross-section of the kinds of things that Buffalo soldiers did. I mean, we have this image of Buffalo soldiers fighting Indians, and, and certainly some of that took place, but, but let, me, let me show you that Buffalo soldiers were, as I said before, carrying out the policy of the federal government, and in, as such, they were going to be used in a variety of ways. For example, in the Battle of Tularosa, New Mexico, a group of Buffalo soldiers literally saved the town. I, I don't have enough time to get into it now, but Tularosa was a town of about 500 people. It was being attacked by uh, a band of Apaches under Victorio. They, were, uh, they assumed they were going to be annihilated. We don't know that's the case. But black soldiers came in and literally rescued the town. And of course, uh, one of the first blacks to gain, they could go to get to be awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor was the first sergeant who led the group of black soldiers into the town of Tularosa. I, I, I told this, at a, I, I, I gave this example of a presentation in San Angelo, Texas, thinking, okay, this is, this is nice, this is a good example. At the end of the hour, a woman walked up with her granddaughter, an older woman with her granddaughter, and she said, my mother remembered those black soldiers face, uh, saving the town. And I was, I was moved by this. I mean, that, that here we have, a, you know, I, I saw a living link to that particular story. We don't have a lot of examples of black soldiers uh, saving towns, but certainly black soldiers were going to be engaged in activities that would result in, uh, in the defense of populations. And that's where I come to, that's how I come to my second example, defense of populations. In this instance, they defended the white settlers of Tularosa. And make, make what you will of this next example. In 1879, 10th Cavalry troops protected Kiowa women and children from Texas Rangers who were bound to try to kill them all. In other words, here are black soldiers saving Indians uh, from, uh, from attack by, by whites, by, by Texas Rangers. Let me give you a third example, 1881. In 1881, units of the 25th Infantry were called upon to provide disaster relief for 1,000 men, women, and children who had been forced out of their homes by a North Dakota flood. As far as we know, this is the first time the Army was used for, the, for disaster relief, and these, of course, were black soldiers who were engaged in this. I, all I could think of was Katrina. All I could think of was the, the hurricane in New Orleans last, last year. In other words, African-American soldiers were actually engaged in activities uh, that were unlike anything that soldiers had normally done before. 1892, 1899, the Coeur d'Alene District of Northern Idaho. Some of you may know it, you've been through it, you've probably driven through it. It was one of the richest uh, ore producing, silver ore producing areas uh, in the world. It was also the center of a lot of mining activity, including union activity. Unions went out on strike in 1892 and in 1899. There was tremendous conflict between the unions and the mine owners and the townspeople got caught in the middle of that conflict. Buffalo soldiers were sent in uh, to, try to, uh, to try to maintain order. As a matter of fact, if you can see on the right, the upper right uh, slide or image, this is, uh, it's a bad image, but it's, it, it's an example of, how will I say this? A corral or better still, a concentration camp that Buffalo soldiers set up for striking miners. In other words, the soldiers rounded up hundreds if not thousands of striking miners and held them there. I will tell you, I, I have personal knowledge of this, that, that there are whites in northern Idaho who still resent Buffalo soldiers or black soldiers precisely because of the, that incident, uh, those incidents in 19, 1892 and 1899. I ran into that uh, in the 1970s when I went up to do, uh, to do interviews. Uh, let me give you some other examples. Oh, these are, these are just other examples that are sort of evident. These on, on the lower right, these are Buffalo soldiers leading Sooners 
or white settlers out of the Indian territory. They tried to get in illegally, that's why they were called Sooners, uh, the, the, and, and leading them out. Uh, here we have Buffalo soldiers guarding miners in New Mexico, Buffalo soldiers at the top guarding stagecoaches. You know, these are the various activities. Sometimes, though, Buffalo soldiers got to do, or some Buffalo soldiers got to do interesting things. This is, yellow, this is the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps in Yellowstone Park. I'll, I'll do this very quickly. Essentially, the Army came up in 1895 with this brilliant idea that they were going to replace the horse with the bicycle. <laughs> okay? Well, come on. I mean, you know, European armies were experimenting with this as well. I mean, there, this was all the rage in Germany and France. Uh, and so they decided, the, the Army, in its infinite wisdom, decided that they were going to use a group of Buffalo soldiers to test whether or not the bicycle was feasible. And so would, would one white officer this unit of Buffalo soldiers set out from Fort Missoula, Montana, to St. Louis. They were gonna ride all the way back there. Remember, there are no roads here, okay? This is, this is 1896. And they were gonna ride all the way back, and you can see them in Yellowstone Park. And there's a great, there's a great quote here. Uh, one of the tourists encountered uh, these cyclists as they rode through Yellowstone Park, and he asked them, what's your destination? Where are you going? And one, one soldier said, the Lord only knows, we're just following the lieutenant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, unfortunately for those Buffalo soldiers, I, I'm sure they had fun riding the bikes all the way back to St. Louis, but unfortunately for the Buffalo soldiers, the Army decided that uh, replacing the horse with bikes wasn't, uh, wasn't practical at that moment. And as a result, the, the Buffalo soldiers' bicycle unit was quickly disbanded. Finally, in 1910, I'll use this as an example, and it's not, this is the best slide that we can get. In 1910, there were a series of forest fires, massive forest fires uh, in northern Idaho and western Montana. To put it in perspective, they were the largest forest fires uh, in the known or recorded history of the West and the nation up until that time. And only the fires, I think, in Colorado and uh, in the early 2000s actually exceeded them. Buffalo soldiers were sent in to fight these forest fires. Now, they hadn't done this before. Nobody had done this kind of work before. And the Buffalo soldiers were sent in, and uh, sometimes they were successful, often they were not. I mean, these were powerful fires that eventually killed 70 people and burned or destroyed, and I'll use the, 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 the figure at that time, $1 billion in timber. And this is, this is by 1910 figures, so you can imagine how much, how much timber would be involved today. Uh, Buffalo soldiers uh, did their job, but unfortunately their job was overwhelming. And it's very interesting because soon after that, the National Parks, uh, excuse me, the, the U.S. government set up uh, a, a group of professional firefighters in the West uh, to fight these fires from this point on. But the first firefighters, the first people to fight fires in the West uh, were, these, were these Buffalo soldiers. I throw this in, this is not part of the text, but I just threw it in because it'll be fun. How many of you are familiar with Captain Abner Doubleday? Some of you are, okay. He is, he is supposedly the inventor of baseball. There's been some dispute about that, but let's assume that that's correct for the purposes of this uh, slide. <laughs> Captain Doubleday, of course, was with the 10th Cavalry, and this is one of his units. And I didn't notice this until I actually took the slide. These are baseball bats in the foreground, and they're baseball gloves. He's teaching these guys He's literally teaching these guys to play baseball. Uh, what better way to, to get knowledge of baseball than from the guy who supposedly invents baseball? But Doubleday is one of a number of examples of, of officers, white officers, who led black troops in the West during this entire period. Perhaps the most famous officer, white officer, white lieutenant and eventually captain of, of black soldiers in the West was John J. Pershing. Uh, the head of the expeditionary forces in Europe later on, General Pershing. Uh, he, he had a tremendous regard. I, I can't get into a lot of this now, but he had a tremendous regard for African-American soldiers at a time when very few of his, very few of his fellow officers shared that, uh, uh, that regard. And yet, and I think that's a good segue into this next slide, <laughs> not only did fellow officers have low regard for African-American soldiers, but many of the townspeople, including, ironically, many of the townspeople who were defended by those black soldiers. You can see this editorial from the Las Cruces 34. Uh, and, and of course, as you can imagine, African-American soldiers were gonna have to deal with uh, a threat that was wholly different 
from forest fires or floods or Native American warriors or the like, they were going to have to deal not just with white prejudice, but often white attack. That, that indeed, in a whole host of places, uh, African Americans, African American soldiers would be maligned. I, again, I don't have time to get into all of this, but just think Brownsville, Texas, 1906, or think Houston, 1917, uh, or think a hundred different occasions in the West. And that's, again, part of the, the, what I call the tragic irony of the Buffalo soldiers. These are men who are called upon to defend uh, the very men, women, and children who in many instances are engaged in the maligning. Now that's not to say that everyone in the West did so. There were, there were thousands of whites who respected and admired the Buffalo soldiers, but there were also thousands of other whites, I, and I would dare say more whites who maligned the Buffalo soldiers or who felt that they, they were useless, as the, uh, as the editorial had argued before. And therein lies the paradox. Therein lies the paradox. Uh, on one hand, these men are needed. They're needed to try to maintain the peace. They are needed to, to, to try to, quote, settle the frontier or to conquer the frontier. And indeed, as such, they have to act like men. They have to be afraid of absolutely no one and nothing. They have to, in effect, uh, they have to embrace and affect the demeanor that would allow them to challenge any, any possibility, any, uh, any, any danger that they would confront. And yet, somehow or another, they were supposed to turn that off when they came in contact with settled society. They were supposed to go back and be subservient again. And a lot of these people couldn't make the switch. And to be honest with you, they shouldn't have had to have made the switch. They shouldn't have had to have gone back and forth between the subservient role and that of, of real men, real soldiers in the United States Army. Obviously Pershing, obviously any of the other leaders of, of the uh, officers of the United States Army expected nothing less of the Buffalo soldiers than to be the best possible fighting men. And yet they lived in an America where African American males were not supposed to be men. And that paradox, that paradox would ultimately lead to tragedy as in Brownsville in 1906 and in Houston uh, in 1917. It would lead to calls for the disbandment of the Buffalo Soldiers in 1917, 1918, and it would lead to uh, continued discrimination against Buffalo Soldiers and indeed all black soldiers until well into the Second World War. But it would also lead to black soldiers and others demanding their freedom. If Buffalo Soldiers could face down those who opposed them in the West, then why couldn't African Americans do the same thing in the rest of the country? And indeed, as, as Carter G. Woodson and others said, the Buffalo Soldiers inspired them to mount a campaign for full civil rights. We'll talk about that campaign. We'll talk about the efforts of blacks in the cities of the West next time we meet. Thank you. <laughs>